Great, it is, it's right lovely to see you. I always think like, I might turn up and I might just talk to myself for like an hour or so, uh, which wouldn't be uncommon really, but um, I really appreciate you um, coming along for our uh, vision evening. This will be about an hour and 15 minutes. That's what we're aiming for. Forgive us if we just go five minutes over. Um, But you'll certainly be out of here before nine o'clock. And uh, do appreciate you giving an evening up to to be here. Um, And the purpose of this evening is to look at what's going on or what has been going on in the life of the church and... Where are we heading? So painting a picture of what's to come. And uh, at the heart of it is vision. And I was thinking about doing these evenings, and this song uh, came to mind. Name that tune. Okie dokie. Anybody know the artist? Ooh, memory test. Jen's going to play the I've Never Heard This Before but I think I heard about it in history lessons, God. Johnny Nash and the song? I can see clearly now. Very good. And I was thinking about talking about vision and stating the blindingly obvious. Um, Vision is about seeing stuff. And um, and it's about looking. And... uh, I'm thinking of these evenings, it's, it struck me that that song by Johnny Nash, I can see clearly now, I thought it matched up a bit with kind of where we are. And I'll, um, I will, if you want to do a little tally chart, I am going to say the word COVID quite a few times, uh, but I might mix it up and occasionally refer to it by other names, the d- disease that must not be named or something. Um, because... I know COVID hasn't gone because God love her. <laughs> Diane comes back from a lovely, lovely holiday in New Zealand. And, you know, alongside, you know, the tap and the duty free, uh, COVID returns <laughs> with her. So it is around. People are getting it. But it feels that as a, as a church community, and in fact the wider community, we're ready to try and move on and look forward. So that's, that's kind of what we're doing tonight. But if vision is all about looking, what I want you to do is just have a little think, and if you want to nap to somebody near you, that's grand, and if you don't, that's also grand. Think of something or someone you would like to see. Now, it can be just Oh, well, I've always loved Scarborough in March, and I'd love to go and see that. It might be, well, I'd like to travel on a rocket to Mars. Uh, you might want to build a time machine and go back in time and, uh, and meet somebody from history. You can do with it whatever you want. It's quite elastic, but something or someone you would like to see. Have a think, and, uh, and then we'll have a bit of a natter.
Okie dokie. Um, just for the sake of recording and everything that's lovely, we'll use the handheld mic. Um, some, some things or some people that you'd like to say, they don't have to be worthy at all. You could just say, you know, just whatever you fancy. Okay, we're not fussed for seeing anyone. Go on, Jen. Jen, Jen the sociable one. I would like to see Everton win anything. Right. <laughs> anything A <at> football all. <laughs> match. <laughs> right. Everton win something. Uh, I share that view. Yeah. Go on. Cheers, on not Pretty straightforward, really. Um, I've got a burning desire to go and see Paris. That was pretty, pretty easily done, but that's what I'd like to do. Oh, Paris. Lovely place. My daughter lived there for two years. Fabulous. I once told a joke in French. It was one of my proudest ever moments. <laughs> and the person on the metro laughed. Anything over here? Uh, I'd like to go back to Dorchester and visit all those places that I used to love so very, very much. Oh, um, get away from it all place. Beautiful. So back kind of nostalgia visit type of thing. Anybody else? Nobody going for the time machine option? Go on, go on. I'd like to see Burnley beat Man City. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to be so ridiculous. I'm, I'm a member of the Richard III Society, so I'd oh. like to go back to see the princes in the tower because I'm convinced they weren't murdered, but in fact escaped. And I'd like to know where they went. All right. Or which part of Belgium they went to. Oh, well, there's a conspiracy theory building here. Yeah. Can't beat them. Have you seen Richard III as in, in Leicester Cathedral? I've not actually seen him at the moment. Well, ah, right. Ah, right. Yeah, I found myself in Leicester for a meeting and bobbed in and paid him my, my respects. Great stuff. Thank you very much for doing that. So we're thinking about vision, and vision is about seeing stuff, which is why opticians put the word vision in the title of their shops. And um, when I was interviewed for the job of Vicar of St. John the Baptist, uh, I had to do a presentation all about vision. Uh, and I did that presentation, and... Uh, Caroline McCall said, I love that phrase, knowing, growing in and sharing Jesus' love in Burst Going Beyond. Where did that come from? And I said, well, it's on your website. <laughs> and it, it's a curious thing. I understand why it happened. Richard, when he was vicar here, did quite a bit of work around vision. We formed a vision statement. And I think quite quickly afterwards, Richard sort of moved on. And kind of it existed, but it wasn't really known. And I think the lovely thing now, and it might not be word perfect, but I think most folk could have a bit of a stab at saying what our vision statement was. Uh, I could ask you to say it now, but I've got a big cheat on the, on the screen. And I've been, you know, doing sort of early doors in the first sort of year or so, quite a bit of communicating about the vision statement. We also did some work formulating a five-year plan. And, um, and that came through sort of talking to people, listening to people, kind of working out what was God saying to us. And coming out of it came this uh, knockoff BMW logo, um, which uh, has this idea of becoming a resourcing church as a sort of surrounding thing. And then four quadrants about growing in spiritual depth, growing in number, growing in service to the community, and planting churches or building and creating new worshipping communities. And the last bit, which is a, a tad too subtle, is the fact that at the heart of all of that is a cross. Now, we did a whole load of lovely evenings like this where we talked to folk about 
the five-year plan. We talked about it in our APCM. We explained what all those different elements meant. And we were talking about our aspirations in each of those areas. And they were great. We were having a lovely, lovely time thinking about it and imagining what it might look like. We also did a bit of work around some values, which are about being rooted in Christ. That everything we do is born out of our relationship with Jesus. That as a church, we're relational. We like being together. We like, you know, worshipping together. And we enjoy having, you know, um, meeting for social activities and things. We also, I think, have a, as a church a value of wanting to be relevant, that how we express faith connects with people and sort of shows a relevance to the good news of Jesus for the present day. And then, unfortunately, fun begins with F, uh, and the other points begin with R, uh, and run doesn't sound like a great value unless, you know, you mark or something, uh, and others who have a predisposition to it. So we, we cheated a bit and said rejoicing. And now that's partly about just having fun along the way, but it's also about that actually an atmosphere and a kind of mindset of praise, worship, thanksgiving are just part of how we go about doing business. That's a bit of a lightning summary of um, our vision statement, the five-year plan that we were sharing and our values. All that makes sense so far. Grand. And what we were doing, and we've talked a couple of times in staff team about this, we shared all of that. We were then running ministry workshops. We'd done a survey about gifts. We're inviting people to think about ministries they might want to be involved in. Um, Jen did a brilliant job, and that board was full of sign-up lists, and people are getting proper, proper excited about where we were going as a church community. And actually, it predated... You know, me being here, because with Simon, he'd been in the here a year, kind of watching, listening, taking stock. We started to talk about church outside of church. Uh, and then, you know, very sadly, he was ill and then died. And there was something of it going on in Richard's time as well. New vision statement, and then he, he kind of moved on to another role. So we've had a few sort of moments like that. And to me, it's that sort of picture. Like when you're going off on your ollie bobs and you've got into the plane and you've got settled in your seat and you've had the fight to get your luggage in an overhead locker. And yeah, seatbelts fastened. You've taxied out onto the runway and you're kind of parked up there and you hear the engine sort of rev up. Well, it'll probably be going that way in terms of revving up the engine. Getting ready, you think, this is it, holidays, here we come, ready for takeoff. And then the captain comes on and says, you know, unfortunately we regret to inform you that the uh, flight won't be taking off and we will be returning you to the terminal where you will be socially distanced, wearing face masks, applying hand gel to every piece of exposed skin, and uh, stockpiling toilet roll and pasta. And you're going to be doing this for two and a bit years. <laughs> that what you were anticipating just got stalled by some bug that may or may not have come from Wuhan. And it felt like all that we were about to do just stalled. Does that kind of ring bells? Is that sort of how it felt for other people? I've seen five people nod. I'll work with that. But I think where we are now feels a bit different. I feel like there's some good news going on. And actually exciting things are happening. So again, just have a natter to anybody who you fancy nattering to or um, just have a think for yourself. What have you noticed in the life of the church? You think, oh, that's quite encouraging, that's quite exciting. Or what have you heard about that's made you think, oh, oh, I like the look of that or the sound of that. If you've got, if you can't think about, that's that's fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hopefully we'll we'll struggle and get two or three things <laughs> together. But anything that you've noticed about the worshiping life of our parish 
that you think, oh, that feels like good news. Have a natter. Okie dokie. Um, anybody got something that they would uh, count as being good news? Something they've noticed in the life of the church? Fabulous. Tell us some good news. <laughs> um, I, we've noticed that uh, we've got the numbers are going up at services, and people who perhaps haven't been to church before have come wants to dip their toe in the water and have come back. Yeah. So, you know, be encouraged. We must be doing something right, folks. And also there's, uh, there's some uh, people who'd sort of stopped coming before COVID who are now returning. I'm noticing, uh, you know, all faces coming back. Great. So for returning to in-person worship, lovely stuff. Anything else that counts as good news? Go on. I was going to ping you and say battling tops. So um, you can put that in as your oh, good news We had a men's well. night, which was really good, a men's games night. And uh, we had lots of old games, crossfire, battling tops. So that was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, great fellowship. And I think we had a lot of guys. I can't remember how many. It was over 30, I think. Um, the other thing I was going to say, I was here on Sunday night, and uh, the young people basically did the oh. service. And it was... I mean, I'm just amazed. I'm a quite an upfront person. I like to be upfront, but I wouldn't have done that at that age. You know, there's young people leading the service, leading the worship, and we should be incredibly proud of our church. Yeah, and young people. yeah, absolutely. And youth band in the morning as well. Um, did you do the ladies' night, Ruth? Uh, not night weekend, Ruth. Oh, tell us about the ladies' weekend. I enjoyed the video today, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, a great weekend of um, fellowship and fun and having fun with bunk beds falling apart on people and toilets <laughs> flooding. Um, but no, we had great fun, blessed by lovely food by Joanna and helpers. And um, yeah, just really nice to get away um, yeah. and do some outdoor activities. Fabulous. And we've also had two absolutely cracking youth weekends with a brilliant team leading and facilitating them. Uh, and just lovely, you know, the amazing young people connected with our church. Sorry, Amy, if I nicked, nicked something you might have done as feedback. I'm, I'm right, sorry. Any other bits and bobs? Or do you want to say out about the youth weekends? Yeah. Yeah, so actually those who were part of those weekends were here on Sunday night. Um, brilliant time of worship, uh, lots of fun. I love the new creativity corner, just different way of exploring faith. Um, Fabby do's. And I'll do one more, slightly embarrassing, uh, for Joe and Mike, who <laughs> suddenly look startled. Um, Rela How long have you been worshipping with us? About six months. And uh, they were just stood too close to me uh, at some point. I went, 
Oh, do you fancy Albin running an alpha course? Do you, want to, do you want to say anything about alpha? Uh, I'm walking towards you with a microphone, which probably means the answer to that is yes. Well, it's a relatively small group, but uh, I think it's been really good with people with their own little testimonies and stories. And we've got some people from outside of the church coming in and uh, just really engaging. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add to that and just a very sort of welcoming space for everyone who's there. That everyone is just, even from day one, has just been open to all the content of the Alpha and open to sharing their own experiences with church and God. And yeah, it's just been amazing to be a part of it. So we're, we're really thankful that you got us involved. Oh, well, I'm absolutely made up. The two of you were stood too close to me at brew time. <laughs> And we've also got a start course going, and I've run hundreds of start courses. There were courses that Neil used to do called Christian Beginnings, and we've sort of rejigged and reformatted. First time in the life I've ever been running a course which is signed, because there's a lad who's fairly new to worshiping with us uh, at the Tuesday service, profoundly deaf, uh, and through Graham Powell, we're doing a course exploring faith but signing my signing is terrible but I have so far learned coffee do you want some milk in it or would you like a cup of tea biscuit uh, cake and a few other useful things some to do with God as well like Jesus but um, I'm kind of picking up on the signing and it's it's just extraordinary to explore faith in a different way. So there's loads of good stuff going on, which is why I've started thinking about this again. Because I'm thinking, oh, do you know what? Should we, should we get back to the, <laughs> back on that runway and rev the engines up again? And should we not perhaps go off on our ollie bobs, but, you know, start seeing more and more of God's kingdom coming in this place? And as I've thought about it, uh, this person has come to mind. So, quiz question, who is this? Now, Jen, you cannot play the age card on this. You can't. Does anybody know who it is? Prince, brilliant. Except a few years ago, before he tragically died, if you don't know who Prince is, brilliant musician, a uh, great recording artist, stunning songwriter as well, wrote loads of songs that other people did. But a few years ago, he decided he didn't want to be called Prince anymore, which is what the thing on the right-hand side, um, it, it, that's how he wanted to be known. And some people were calling him Symbol, some people were calling him Squiggle, most people called him the artist formerly known as Prince. So I want to introduce you to the artist formerly known as the five-year plan. <laughs> because it seems bonkers calling it a five-year plan because the whole time scale just got blown out the water by coronavirus. And uh, so we just, I mean, it's rebranding and we're not going to shoot anybody who says five-year plan, but we're just trying to call it a mission action plan. Very, very common terminology for describing what a church is focusing on as its priorities at the moment. So we're going to think a little bit about our map and certain key areas. And the first one is about growing in depth, growing in depth of our relationship with God. And key to churches growing is actually people growing in their faith. Um, a very famous man uh, who was Bishop of Doncaster, once said, you make new Christians by making Christians new. There is something about that transformation as we grow in our relationship with Jesus that helps other people find faith. And within Scripture, there is a sort of threefold model for how faith is nurtured. Within the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, household, small group, was really important. That was where faith was taught. You know, you get the idea of, you know, at the Passover, 
passing on the story of God's salvation and that done in a household, a small kind of cell group setting. Within the Hebrew tradition and the Jewish worship, there is the notion of a synagogue, a place of gathering for worship. And then, prior to the destruction of the temple, the festivals, the celebrations, the gathering together with God's people for a bit of a hooli. Uh, a time of great celebration with you know, people of faith from all around the place come together. And actually, in the New Testament, you see a similar model, and certainly not just in the New Testament, the history of the early church, something similar happening. Early groups of Christians were in little cell groups, small groups, a handful of believers in a particular location. What we see is a picture of those groups expanding and growing and starting to meet together difficult in times of persecution, but Christian churches forming. Paul writes to them in his letters. And as you move out the New Testament and into the life of the early church, the idea of celebration and coming together was also really important and first sort of manifested in the kind of pattern of pilgrimage, groups of people going to special places, holy places, and gathering together. So that threefold sort of sense of ways of growing seems to be a really important biblical precedent, so it seems quite important that churches do it. We have some kind of small group setting for nurturing faith. We meet in our various congregations, and we go off and have a bit of a hooli. So we might do new wine, spring harvest. We might go off to... Uh, dreaming the impossible or soul survivor back in the day or we might go to Keswick but Christians gathering for a big celebration bit of a hooli and so what we're trying to do within the life of St. John's is reinvigorate our small group structure now I will do a proper apology in a bit but what had happened is for a number of reasons, including uh, a recent pandemic, um, it all got a bit, we'd, we'd lost track of what was going on and we weren't sure what were happening about groups. And I can remember when Kathy and myself first arrived here, we had all the house groups around our house for meals and we served up endless baked potatoes <laughs> and various different fillings and Kathy's absolutely fabulous meringues. And it was great. There were loads of groups came along. And you think, oh, this looks great. And then we just lost track of things. I'm not having a pop at anybody. I'm not criticising anybody. It was a whole set of circumstances that meant that we just lost track of where we were and what kind of groups we had, which were meeting, which weren't functioning anymore. So we decided quite recently to find out what's an accurate picture of what we got. So we sent out a survey and, and the response was astounding. Normally, you send out a survey, any company or organisation does a survey, if they get a 10% response back, they are over the moon because that signals a really good response. We got something like a 50% response from our congregation. Utterly brilliant, over 100 responses. And what we've done is sort of analysed all the data we got back and worked out where we are. And there's some right encouraging things. So we had 79 people saying, I'd like to be in some kind of small group. And I've used the language of growth group. Now, the reason for using that, um, and again, I'm not, but I hear this slightly tongue-in-cheek and uh, with real affection because tons, particularly in my early Christian life, tons of my growth and development as a Christian came in a small group, a house group. But one of the things that can happen with house groups is... 
You've been meeting for 20 odd years and you've got the materials and you, there's a question. You think you could go around the room and you could guess everybody's answer to the question because you've heard it several times. And also, um, sometimes you meet together and you've not met for a bit and it's lovely to have a catch up and you're catching up on news and lots of lovely things. And then somebody looks at their watch and says, flipping heck, it's half past nine. Um, somebody say a quick prayer, we better go, kind of thing. Now, all of that's lovely because it's about friendship and it's fellowship and it's relationship. But sometimes small groups can just get um, a bit safe and a bit comfortable and a bit familiar and sometimes slightly lose the focus of why they're meeting, which is why using language of growth group says that actually for all the things that we do, including having lovely brews and biscuits and um, enjoying friendship and fellowship and catching up on news and praying and looking at the scriptures, the fundamental purpose of the group is to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ, growing in spiritual depth. So we had 79 people say, oh, growth group, love to be in one of them, or I'm already in one and I love it. We had, uh, I can't read the numbers there, look over me, 33 people saying, I am in a micro group and it's great. A couple of them are a bit bumpy, but actually, I think one of the narratives that sort of floated around is that microgroups have been a right flop. And actually, they haven't. That we've got currently nine groups meeting. And, you, and the, the, the overall narrative is this is really good. Now, for those who are new or can't remember, um, we created microgroups because... During that time when there was a bug floating around and we were all wearing face masks, um, um, we couldn't meet in groups of more than six. And obviously everybody was abiding by those rules, <laughs> uh, unless it was a work do or cheese and wine or something. But those were the regulations. So we thought, ooh, limit of six. Why not come up with the idea of a microgroup? Four people who meet together catch up on news and things, look at the scriptures together, pray together, connect with one another, you know, through the sort of week, you know, WhatsApp group or whatever. And in the right sense, have a measure of accountability because it's a smaller group and hopefully a bit safer. If somebody who's in a group says, do you know what, there's somebody at work who just winds me up and I find it really hard being around them, and I'd really like you to pray that somehow my attitude to them changes. Well, the next time you can meet, say, oh, you know, you mentioned that thing about, you know, your attitude to this person. How's it been? Well, it were a bit unfortunate when I decked them by the coffee point, but I'm hoping we can perhaps recover ourselves from that position. You know, but actually they might say, do you know what? I've prayed for them and somehow I see them in a different light. So it's that, not heavy accountability, but encouraging, spurring one another on, the love and good works. That's a great Bible verse. So it's that sense of how can we help one another move forward in our Christian journey? Um, do, how many of you remember coming to a Bible study done by uh, Elliot on the book of Habakkuk? So you are representative. Oh, and Phil, can you remember out about it? Brilliant. Use the word absolutely brilliant. Look at the book of Habakkuk and you think, flipping heck, if I had to open my Bible and find it, I'd be doing that sort of random flicking or casually trying to look at the index. It was a book that Eliot really valued and he did some fantastic insight into the book. Uh, anybody remember cruising the Mediterranean with St. Paul? Good on you, <laughs> Phil. Tell us how terrible it was. <laughs> 
It was great. I remember there were, <laughs> there were, there were mocktails and, um, yeah, there was a little drink station and we went on a yeah. journey and you had all the maps of the, the journeys to St. Paul. But, yeah, it was great. Great. And that was, we basically turned church into a cruise ship. We had the cocktail bar. We had it arranged cafe style. Some people had dressed the holiday theme by wearing Hawaiian shirts on a regular basis. I felt the need to wear a ship's captain uniform just because I wanted to. This was turned into the ship's wheel and we looked at the kind of journey, missionary journey of St. Paul but tied it in with his epistles. So we looked at kind of Philippi. We looked at Athens and Corinth. We did a bit about Ephesus as well. And we looked at kind of the narrative in Acts but what else we learned about those places and also what we knew about them historically. And it was the aim to sort of understand a bit more about why Paul wrote what he wrote to those places. And folk, you know, have been right positive about them. So what we want to do is kind of do those more regularly. So it's like folk who say, I can't keep it to a small group. Life is too busy, but... Do you know what? If you put on a Bible wig, I'll try to get to a couple of them. And the idea is each evening will be a standalone, but they obviously will be interconnected. I'll give you details of what's coming up. Current state of play, nine microgroups. It'd be great to get up to 12. Current state of play, and it's all in the notes with the green frontage. Um, six uh, functioning house groups. And actually, if you flip over the page, you'll find that we could actually scale up to 12 house groups with not a lot of effort because they're kind of almost good to go. So looking at doing something geographically based, although it's not tied to, you know, if you live in a particular area, working on recruiting hosts and leaders. So six of them, boom, they're there, we're running. Another six who without too much hard graft, certainly by, you know, May time, we'd hope we could have those up and running as well, which is fantastic. That's really encouraging. We've also got a thing called Prayer Connect. It's a prayer meeting, Monday evening, Thursday morning, uh, meet twice. Attendance varies, but it's pretty much solid, at least 20 people gathering a week to pray, and some people see that as their place of belonging, their small group. So I've kind of indicated with growth groups what we've got and what we might have. Um, any questions about any of that? I'll just provide a little bit more detail in a moment, but... Anything just about microgroups, you've got a brief introduction to them. I think most of you will understand the idea of a house group, home group, uh, growth group. They're, they're pretty, si pretty similar things. Questions, comments, observations? It's always worrying when you scratch your eyebrow, Stuart, because I'm likely, oh, big question coming from Stuart. Are you happy if we crack on and I'll, uh, I'll do my I am sorry? So, uh, just simply because they all began with the letter R. Regrets. I've had a few. <laughs> and I think house groups, small groups, growth groups, home groups, cell groups, whatever we call them, micro groups, are so important. And I am sorry that we have neglected it. And I say that's not an accusation. That's not having a pop at anyone. Whole set of circumstances brought that about. But the focus now is to get this aspect of our church life humming along and really going well. So we can look back and think, mm, might have been better to do X, Y, or Z. That's the past. Looking forward, we know what we'd like to do. Um, where we're at at the moment is this refresh, relaunch, renew sort of phase. These are the groups we've got got some new ones up and ready to roll. If you want to be in one, to be honest, the best thing to do is contact Leslie Millie because Leslie is lovely and super organized. And if you ask me, I'll scribble it on a back of, you know, a piece of paper 
I put it in my back pocket of my jeans and then the, I'll put them in the washer uh, and then there'll just be some mush there. I think, oh, that's somebody who wanted to be in house group. Leslie is the main point of contact for small groups. Get in touch with her and she'll be able to sort you out. If you're in an existing group and you love it, fabulous. With no disrespect to a group that you might be in, if you're thinking, I'm ready for a bit of a bit of a shake up, a bit bit of something different, meet some new people. Let us know if you'd like to transfer groups. Um, and if you're thinking, I'm ready to join one and I've not previously been in one, let us know. One of the things I think we fail to do, and going forward will be different, regular meeting with small group leaders. What's going on in your groups? What's going well? Bit of feedback? Anything that particular challenges? You know, thought, hate, praying out loud? Well, different ways of thinking about praying, whatever it is. But investing in the leaders of small groups, because it is probably, it's one of our really, really important assets. I'm sorry to use that kind of language, but it's so, so important to the flourishing of the church, investing in those folk and saying, we value what you do and we want to keep that regular contact. And if there's pastoral issues appropriately shared that you know need to be fed back, there will be regular meetings with leaders. And there will also be help with resources. Now, some groups are great. Oh, well, we've got these studies on Amos. We absolutely love them. We're in. That's what we're doing. Another form I'd say, it'd be right helpful. We'd, we'd, you know, can we have some resources, some materials? Can you recommend two or three things? I've got to say, and it might just be people who are, you know, being nice to me. Folks seem to be loving this. <laughs> I, I like Robin's writing style, fresh approach, and it does seem to have been a bit of a hit, and we've done some small group material related to it, we're tying our sermons into it, but we will do our best to resource the groups and the leaders. All that makes sense? Right. Last couple of bits. Occasional Bible studies. One of the things... There's so many wonderful things about St. John's. We have got some folk who are part of our worshipping communities who are brilliant at teaching the Bible. Dave Emmett, who's, you know, got a whole string of ologies behind his name in terms of qualifications, lecturer at a theological college, and who, when he, when he does talks, folk are like, that's great, loved it, you know, the insights, the background, whatever. So I rang Dave up and I said, how would you fancy in Holy Week doing a series of studies, looking at themes of Holy Week or picking up the idea of sacrifice and how that theme plays out in the Bible? It was that vague. And he says, oh, that sounds really interesting. Just give us a bit of time. Uh, and I'll, I'll have a think about it and I'll get back to you. I kid you not. Five minutes later, he rang me and said, I was thinking about doing this theme between the idea of calling of God's people and individuals and the theme of sacrifice. I thought we could look at these four passages. And for Monday, Thursday, I thought we could pick up the whole narrative of God's people and the story of salvation, linking it to the past. And I'm just like... Flipping heck, you've had five minutes on this. And this is absolute genius. You're making the rest of us look bad, Dave. But honestly, it, it'll make your brain work and you'll be thinking and there'll be discussion and all that. But it'll be an absolute treat. So that's what our Holy Week is. Monday, Thursday will be a bit shorter because we'll also celebrate communion together. But it'll be... It'll be class, and I know that because I've been in Bible studies with Dave. And we've also got somebody else who I've, I've tapped up to do something about life in the spirit, and, and they seem pretty keen. They haven't definitely said yes, um, 
but we're 80% of the way there. So again, we've got dates of when we, we would be doing that. Right, last thing, Q&A, and then a chance to stretch and just uh, nip to the loo or make another brew if you want it. Um, one of the things that was suggested, I mean, we, we are incredibly blessed for the range of worship that we offer, but somebody said, could we occasionally have, I'm sorry to use sort of trivial language, a bit of a bless up, which, um, you know, I mean, I, I could kind of try and wrap that up in original Greek and stuff like that, but basically, a sung time of worship where we really draw close to God, digging into the scriptures and exploring that together, time of prayer, and also some time for sort of ministry and the power of the Spirit and being open to the expression of the gifts and just, you know, having a, a cracking time of encounter with God uh, through his word and through his Spirit. And uh, floated that idea, talked to some people about it, and they were like, bring it on, would love it. And it's complimenting all the rest that we do, but... We've got that, we've arranged one, and if it like absolutely flies, we'll do it again. And if it stutters a little bit, we'll do it again. If it crashes and burns, we'll still probably do it again and learn some lessons. But it's just a, another opportunity for worship amongst the, the richness of uh, the stuff we offer. Whew, draw breath. Uh, questions, anything you want to know, Any? Anything about the stuff that I've said about big picture, vision, mission, action, plans, values, or stuff to do with small groups? Oh, God love you. Oh, God, I, I've got to say, just in case he hadn't picked up on it, I am proper excited about this. Because I, I just, I, I have the privilege of <laughs> meeting with you in loads of different ways. I just think, you're a fabulous bunch. And I just think the idea of get to me, there's, I have very simple views of way, ways of viewing Christian ministry. Uh, you love God, you love people, you try and bring the two together. Or you try and get more of God into people and more people into God. And I just think the idea of getting more of God into people in a small group setting, I just, I'd pay money to do that. <laughs> God love them, the Church of England gives me money to do it. How else? Sorry, I'm in danger of getting overly excited and I'm late taking my medication. Um, how else about small groups? Great, we'll take a short comfort break, leg stretch, charge back and get another brew or whatever. And then we've got about 20 minutes on something called Fit for Mission. It's about, on one level, it is organisational change within the Diocese of Liverpool. You're like, oh, forget the house groups. Let's talk about governance, because I can't get enough of it. Um, it might seem like this is not the most exciting thing in the world. I actually think it could be an incredibly exciting thing, because the name Fit for Mission is about enabling... God's people to be fit to engage in God's mission. So at the heart of what we're going to look at, that's what it's about. So that'll be the next sort of chunk of about 20 minutes. But have a break now, get a brew, have a wee, stretch your legs, bolt for the door. <laughs> if we're able to uh, we'll just let those who are just getting a brew um, come in C 
cracking. So, um, this virus that's been able to produce uh, endless alpha, beta, uh, gamma, delta, epsilon, and all the other letters of the Greek alphabet variants, um, there is quite a bit of bad news connected with it. So, I'm just going to um, share some of that. Um, when... When the sort of lockdowns were easing, and first off, when we could actually start doing in-person worship again, we started doing one service. And we were obviously still doing online. We were recording material. We were doing Zoom services and stuff, all of which actually had, you know, real life and energy. But there's something lovely about gathering together for worship. And I'll be honest, when we looked out, and saw the number of folk attending. I'm like, you know, what's happened? There's, there's nobody here. Well, there was 20, 25 people. I'm thinking, we were a congregation of 250. You know, what's happened? And I knew people were shielding, people being careful, people were enjoying online opportunities, this, that, and the other. Uh, and there was a slow, steady job you know, in incremental increase and I know there were people who were saying to be honest until we can sing I just this doesn't feel like worship as I want to express it and again fully understand that but there was this real drop off in attendance and and I'm not normally given to panic uh, and in fact I don't think I panicked I just thought <gasps> There's a problem here, we need to fix it. And I was a bit, a bit stupid, went slightly into overdrive, tried to think of all the different ways in which we could reconnect with people, a number of which worked really well. But I basically broke my head. Um, my brain just got frazzled and, you know, a predisposition that's been there through quite a bit of my life of being a bit melancholy and this strange combination of Tigger and Eeyore. Well, Eeyore just came to town and moved in and, and I, I basically made myself bully and, you know, I had to t take time off with depression. I, but what was behind that was I'm thinking, what's happening to God's church? And actually, I did some research and, you know, asked folk their experiences and... What came out was that actually most churches, in fact, nearly every church experienced something between, and has experienced, something between a 20 and 30% decline in congregation size. Rural, urban, suburban, different traditions, you know, whatever you pick, across the board, congregations are between 20 and 30% smaller. And if you look at St. John's, you know, we were pre-COVID, we were bouncing around about 250. We're now bouncing around sort of about 200. And, and it breaks my heart, and it really does, and it continues to break my heart. Uh, and I want God's church to flourish and grow and be the good news that God's called us to be. During COVID, because, you know, aside from learning film editing and mastering Zoom, I needed something else to do in my life. So I was involved in a project in our deanery to help write a deanery mission, uh, mission action plan. And uh, it all had to be done online via Zoom calls and all the rest of it. But because this is bread and butter to me, because I've done it for 25 odd years in different roles, I said I'd have a go at doing it. So we did a survey of church health in our local area. You might not be particularly Church of England-y, but churches in a particular area, a uh, locality, are lumped together in something called deaneries. We're in a thing called Ormskirk Deanery. And uh, myself and others, particularly Stephen McGee, who was brilliant at it, analysed a whole load of data. Whoa! Let's party. And we looked at financial health 
basically is what's coming in and going out about in the same place. And now there's some reserves there as well. And then we also looked at congregation size. We did it all in proportion to size of the local community and this, that and the other. And we subtly nuanced it according to age profile and demographics and particularly looking at the presence of children and young people in the church. And uh, all of this data was provided by the churches to our diocese. We got permission to analyse it, got it in, looked at it, uh, worked, crunched some numbers, projected everything forward five years as well, because we were having such a good time, me and Stephen. And we then did a red, amber and green coding. So, with all the kind of nuancing of the data, not just, you know, um, um, simple looking at it, if you were healthy in two categories, finance and numbers, you were green. If you were healthy in one of them, but not in the other, you were amber. And if actually, in terms of your church finances and your attendance, projected forward five years. Uh, if you were healthy in both categories, it was red. So, this, not easy to see, but I'll show you it. What you've got is Ormskirk Deanery. Oh, thank you for doing that for me, Vic. And you've got five churches that are green. Oh, were you yawning? Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said, picked on you at that point. I, I, I'm putting it down as an exasperation. Here we go. We'll deploy a uh, pointy stick. So, um, right up at the top there, that's St. John the Baptist Church. So, that's us right at the top of our deanery. Um, could you just mute this while I'm... That's a thought, isn't it? That's a lot better idea. There we are. So, that's St. John's, uh, that's Christ Church Orton, that's St. Michael's Orton, over here is St. Paul's Skelmersdale, and over here is Rainford. They were our green churches. We then had three churches that were in an amber category. There was either issues about finance or the number of people turning up at church percentage-wise. And we have eight churches who were in a red category, which meant that their health in five years' time was, ser well, their existence in five years' time was in serious questions, could be asked about it. That's our deanery, that's our local setting. That is true all across um, uh, Liverpool Diocese. It's true all across the Church of England. And in our diocese, the response has been to come up with a programme called Fit for Mission. Fit for Mission is about mission and churches being healthy enough to engage in it. It has four key kind of drivers that it wants to enable. Introducing people to Jesus, helping people become Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, deepening our relationship with Jesus, developing leaders and engaging in social justice, declaring the kingdom of God and that being expressed in the way in which we live out our faith and the way in which we make a stand for justice, which is one of the five marks of mission. And um, what I'm going to do is just show you a video which explains a little bit about fit for mission. As Christians, we want to see our churches grow. We pray for our neighbours to see and feel God's love. We pray for more people know Jesus and we seek to see more justice in the world. The growth of God's kingdom here on earth has always been and always will be our priority. But the reality is that in the UK, fewer people are part of a community of faith than ever before. The Diocese of Liverpool is focused on changing this reality, and to do that, we have to work together. 
We know the gravity of the situation we are facing, and we can't leave it for another generation to solve. If we want to see our churches thrive, then some things will have to change. Fifth permission is about that change. With fewer of us in church, we are still trying to do the work of many, within structures established a long time ago. Think about the area you live in. Who do you see every day? Perhaps someone you know like. I'm Rob and I'm 43. I recently got divorced and I've got two young kids and I work two jobs. I work most weekends just to make ends meet. When I'm not working, seeing my kids is my priority. I really wish I could play football with my mates at weekends, but life's just too busy. Hi, I'm Eleanor. I'm 28 and I'm from Venezuela. I'm a researcher at the University of Liverpool and I've been living in the UK for over a year. I haven't found a church that feels comfortable to me. I grew up in a Christian family and I miss being part of a Christian community. I just miss being able to express my love for Jesus and worship how I used to back home. Hi, I'm Marie. I'm 42 and I moved to the area a few years ago to be close to my sister. Due to health issues, I'm not able to work at the moment, but I miss being part of a community. I've only been in churches for weddings and funerals recently because I find it difficult to access the churches near where I live. Hi, I'm uh, Callum. I'm 14. I'm in year nine. Uh, I love gaming and spending time with my friends. Uh, I love watching games on uh, you know, Instagram and YouTube, but I've never been in a church before. I don't know anyone who goes. Every person who has yet to find a life with Jesus is unique and with their own story and own needs. Rob, Anna, Marie and Callum are already loved by God. Jesus died for them, but we need to change if we want them to join us in worship and be part of the community of God's people. This is what Fit for Mission is about. Fit for Mission will help local churches do more of what already works and find new ways to reach people Thousands of people could be introduced to a worshipping community and begin a relationship with Jesus if we all play our part. Fifth Commission is about enabling us today to take the Great Commission into our neighbourhoods. Fifth Commission is focused on more people knowing Jesus, more justice in the world, leaders being developed and discipleship being deepened. It's about bringing us together to share our strengths, grow faith, and transform our communities. Together, we can make this possible. Great stuff. What I'll do is, oh, we'll listen to Johnny Nash again. Um, I'll try and explain as concisely as I can what Fit for Mission represents. So we have a multitude of parishes and churches making up Ormskirk Deanery. Each church has a pl the opportunity to look at Fit for Mission and decide whether it's going to engage in it or not. Behind the programme is the idea of creating one large parish. The reason for doing that is each church has to find church wardens, a treasurer, a secretary, a safeguarding officer. We are unbelievably blessed that we've got fantastic wardens. We've got a superb treasurer brilliant secretary. We have somebody who does safeguarding really well. My son-in-law, Toby, works in Rotherham in a deprived in the city community. He has one church warden who doesn't want to do the job anymore. The treasurer uh, gave up the job about three years ago, so Toby is doing the account and it is not his area of gift or skill, but nobody else can, will do it. And nobody wants to take um, notes and act as PCC secretary. 
when he arrived in the parish, he was aware that there was a quite serious safeguarding incident that was about to sort of... Um, the outworking of that was about to happen and there was no safeguarding officer and he felt incredibly vulnerable. Our experience at St. John's is really unusual to have this quality of resources and to be able to fill those really important roles. One of the things that Fit for Mission is trying to do is centralise certain things to do with governance and structure. So it means that actually you have one large parish, you have a group of wardens who do the responsibilities that wardens have across the whole parish, uh, particularly acting as bishop's officers. It don't mean that they're responsible for every single church and every bit of detail, but the, the legal responsibilities of a church warden are conducted by a warden's team that are central. There is a simplification of finance, so each church's money remains its money, but it sits within one account as designated funds. And it means that churches don't have to scrabble around trying to find a treasurer. And actually, you've got the potential for paying for a role of treasurer using certain funds that will be allocated. So the centralisation of certain structures just takes a huge burden off some churches. Safeguarding will be done to a high quality with the assurance that comes from that. So you might see the kind of orange sort of oval. Well, that, that is the one big parish. The red cross indicates some centralised, I know some folk don't like the word centralised, call it a hub, whatever you want to, that services all the different worshipping communities and provides some of those central uh, functions that have to be done. And then you'll see sort of red and green have disappeared and amber. And instead, you've got sort of uh, purpley. Um, there are existing worshipping congregations and ministry will still happen in locations and there will still be local focus to organising ministry and, uh, and exercising that. So it's still, it won't be like some you know, super kind of organisation which loses its local function. There'll still be the sort of local branches or um, uh, expressions of uh, worshipping communities. And Fit for Mission is designed to actually create some new worshipping communities, which are the sort of light blue dots. And the experience you might have heard about Wigan, lots of good things about what's happened in Wigan, some not so good things, some important lessons learned. But one of the things they've done is created new worshipping communities. You might remember Elliot, who was curate here, if you knew him. He's gone and done that and created worshipping communities for young adults, which was not happening Wigan prior to him and Joe and the family going and doing that work. And in Wigan, they reckon they are in touch with a thousand people who previously had no contact with the church. So that's what Fit for Mission is. Positives, it creates new mission opportunities. It models working together. I have the extraordinary joy and privilege of having colleagues. We've got Chris to work with and Laura to work with. We've got the staff team. And it's brilliant because you sense we're in it together. Most parishes, there's one clergy person flogging away on their own, feeling really isolated and vulnerable and wishing that they had a sense of partnership in the gospel. It creates simplified structure that frees up capacity and it creates the opportunity 
for creating new worshipping communities. There are other things to think about. Working out how the finances will work within the larger parish. There's some work to be done working that through. What it's not about is nicking people's money, but it's about putting that money to work. There are questions about staffing and how, particularly with a church like our, ours, where we have paid members of staff, and how might that sort of be reconfigured um, in this new arrangement, and also questions about how staffing is deployed across the larger, the larger parish. Um, we're not getting a curate in June. Uh, it does make me think, like, flipping heck, how, how do we go from three members of staff in terms of ordained plus dulled to just me running around like a loon trying to make stuff happen? And you just, ooh. Uh, and it, there will be changes about how staffing is allocated, and we need to think about that. Some church buildings are not fit for purpose and are a liability. And it will be hard, but for in some areas, the congregation will still exist, but they might not be worshipping in the building that they have always known. And that, emotionally, is quite challenging for, um, for folk in those settings. Behind Fit for Mission is a serious attempt to do things differently. Einstein once said that the definition of insanity was repeating the same actions and expecting different outcomes. We have exercised ministry a particular way for a long, long, long time. And it clearly isn't bearing the fruit that it should. But it's what we know and what's precious to us. And it's always been like that. And changing a mindset is a real, real challenge. And the last thing to say is, will it work? And, and I can't say yes or no. It is like going on a journey, driving a car while you're building the car. Because the whole idea of fit for mission is you step out on a journey doing things differently and working it out as you go along. And that's risky and there isn't a guarantee of success and it might go a bit wonky and it might not work in certain areas. And it's un uncharted territory and there is no guarantee of success. But equally... The, the red, amber, and green dots, what we're currently doing actually has no guarantee of success beyond the sovereignty of God and the work of his spirit. So, we've talked about, within our mission action plan, um, becoming a resourcing church. Is engaging with fit for mission part of that living out that uh, aspiration, that part of our mission action plan? Or actually, are we doing a great job already and we can see ways of doing more good stuff and should we just crack on as we are? And that's the question we've got to explore. And it's for us a whole church family to look at within all our different congregations. Ultimately, PCC needs to make a decision about whether it's going to opt into the program or not. We will have to make that decision probably in October or November. But to do this right, we actually need to sound out the whole church family and all our congregations. It's not PCC doing it in isolation, which is why I wanted to share this information with you. In those notes about Fit for Mission, you'll see various different things are happening about kind of uh, opportunities to find out more about Fit for Mission. If you're thinking, I've loved that so much, come back Saturday morning. 
9.30 for a brew and the rest of the cranberry hobnob type biscuits. Uh, and you'll hear from the, the diocesan team ways of taking this forward. You've got some other information about future dates, stuff we do about the coronation, some socials that we're planning and uh, all that kind of good stuff. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop at that point and remind us of our theme verse, that whatever we do and however we do it, and whether we engage in fit for mission or not, how we try and move forward our small groups, it is about considering how we can spur one another on to love, love for one another, love for Jesus Christ and good works, putting our faith into action. So what happens on a Sunday or a Tuesday shapes what we do Monday through Saturday and every aspect of our life. And I'm proper excited about us seeing that theme verse expressed in our small groups and potentially in our engagement with Fit for Mission. Sorry, I've gone on two or three minutes more than I said. If you need to slip away or you want to scoot, that's absolutely fine. If you've got any questions or, oh, can you just explain that a bit more? Uh, I think the best thing is just come and grab me at the end or talk to me on Sunday. You might have <laughs> head exploding, too much information, in which case process it, have a chat with me, uh, and I'll, I'll do my best to sort of explain what's going on. I'll pray if that's all right. We're in trouble if you say no. Let us consider how to spur one another on to love and the good works. And Lord, thank you for the time spent together this evening, for one another and for what we, uh, our common faith in Jesus. Help us to be like folk on a fun run, encouraging one another, um, helping one another along, making progress on that journey of faith. Whether we're like some super athlete who's dead fit or somebody part running, part walking with a buggy or we might be dressed as a banana because we thought it was a good idea at the time. But we are all on this journey of faith. We want to encourage one another, spur one another on. So we grow in love for one another, for our community and the world that we are called to serve. And we want to grow in our love for you, Lord, deeper and deeper. And Lord, the faith that we have, which could be nurtured through small groups, through worship, through studying scripture, Lord, help us to put that into action. So faith makes a difference in the way in which we live. And whatever we do with fit for mission, we pray that mission may be at the heart of all that we do. Because it is in your heart, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much indeed for coming along. If you've got questions, come and grab me. Um, lovely to see you. And, you know, we've had half the church turn out for these evenings, which is just give yourself a big pat on the back because you are lovely. Top job, Stuart. You actually literally took it to be true. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you.